it's my uh, privilege to uh, introduce you to Paul Srivastava. I asked him if he wouldn't mind. I, I have a, you, you, this is archaeological evidence. I have a formal uh, presentation of Paul. But I think um, you will understand Paul when you will listen to him. I don't know him for that long. I, I have met him first due to International Year of Global Understanding through the ends of Beno Velen, who is seated over there. And I immediately uh, understood why Beno had invited Paul to go to that uh, pr presentation opening of the IYGU. And uh, try, try to imagine how can you really connect the humanities, technology, entrepreneurship, science, and daily life in a way that you don't push the humanities through each of these topics by trying to say, look, people, technology is nice, but we have a contribution to make. Education is nice, but we also have a, a contribution to make. Entrepreneurship and whatever. No, you don't do like that. You do as Paul does. So this is my introduction. Paul, please. OK. Thank you very much, Louis. I thought making it uh, an informal introduction would make it easier for me, but you have made it more difficult. So uh, I guess I have to stand here, right, because of this. I, I think there was a mobile microphone somewhere. Is there, there's a mobile microphone. Can we get it? Okay, I'll get started in, in the meantime because this is a hour-long talk, but I'm going to try to do it in a little less time because we are running a little bit late. And uh, I sometimes feel standing behind the podium is like hiding from you. I have no secrets. I have no suspicion of you. I know all of you are very safe. So I feel very constrained standing here. And in a few minutes, you will realize how important it is to be unafraid of doing things that come from the heart. So what I want to talk about today is something that I've been deliberating for the last eight years, this relationship between science, sciences, and the humanities, arts, and other things. I think it is one of the uh, unfortunate legacies of the Age of Enlightenment that it separated emotional knowledge from rational knowledge, and now we have these disciplines in which we are trapped in some ways and cannot make a more holistic sense of the world. So the talk is about uh, what is the Anthropocene? Why is it different? Why we need to unify knowledge in this period? And how can we unify sciences with the arts and humanities. Just by way of outline. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll speak for a few minutes on uh, the notion of the Anthropocene. Uh, the idea of the, and this is mostly scientific evidence, so that you don't leave this room knowing at least the basics of how the world is actually changed physically, as well as socially and culturally. But the physical manifestations for the planet are very significant. I'll talk about how I characterize knowledge in this new period that is being called the Anthropocene. And then I'll talk about Future Earth, a knowledge platform that was created by UNESCO. And we very much hope that CIPSH is going to become a part of that conversation. Uh, and then finally, some ideas about how unification could occur between the arts, sciences, and humanities. So here, there's a lot of scientific data. This is 10 years of studies. We call it the Great Acceleration. On the left-hand side, you see a number of socioeconomic trends. On the right-hand side, you see Earth system trends, physical trends to what's happening to the planet. You have variables that are being tracked. There are actually many more variables than are re reflected over here. Here we have uh, GDP and uh, population growth and uh, water use and paper production, international tourism. These are socioeconomic trends on the left. 
You have Earth system strains like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, nitrous oxide, methane, ozone, etc. There's only one thing I want to say about this. This goes from 1750 to 2010. In that period, all of the curves have basically one trend. From 1750 to 1950, you see a kind of mild rise. And suddenly in the 1950s, all the trends shoot up. This is what we are calling the great acceleration. There are many, many natural scientists and social scientists who have been studying this phenomenon, and they are saying that something different has happened in the 1950s. After the wars, more prosperity, more technology, more population, more consumption, more production, more destruction of the environment. So this period is now actually being called a different period. The name Anthropocene means a period in which the Anthropos, humans, are the primary force of nature. All the natural cycles are being disturbed to a point that we are destabilizing the life support system that have brought forth civilization. And we are destabilizing them in terms of the planetary boundaries. This is another piece of research that some of you are probably familiar with. Johan Rockström and his group at uh, Stockholm Resilience Center have been studying how far can you push the Earth before it cracks on some of the major cycles, the hydrological or water cycle, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. There are nine boundaries that are defined essential for life. Out of the nine boundaries, on several of the boundaries, we are already in the red zone. We are breaking some of these boundaries. And so we are very close to changing the world permanently, irreversibly, in ways that are not helpful for sustainability for our own life. And we are not done with it. Almost two billion people of the seven billion that are on Earth today are still living under two dollars a day. We still need development and growth in Africa and India and other places which haven't reached a living standard that we have in the West and the industrial North. So this process of development is going to continue. We need to find safe operating limits with the understanding that humans are the main agents for all natural change. That is why we are calling it the Anthropocene. It's a, a term that reflects our agency as human beings and our responsibility on a planetary scale. So I want to add to it a few other disruptive changes that are happening around the world, particularly in my part of the world. With the election of Mr. Trump and uh, uh, the, the, the fragmentation of political consensus at uh, national levels and international levels, the economic inequality that all of you have heard of in this conference, the extreme inequality that a uh, study that was released in November was pointing out that uh, almost 50% of the wealth is in the hands of 1% of the world. And this particular study that was released uh, 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 by, the, by UNESCO partly showed that it's not actually 1% of the world that holds 50% of the wealth. It's just 62 individuals. This kind of inequality, this kind of disparity, it, this is not healthy, this is not rational, this is not supportable, this is not sustainable. And if we don't do something to acknowledge it, we are going to run into even more destabilizing political situations and conditions. In addition to social disruptions and economic disruptions, you also have huge technological disruptions. Uh, new technologies like blockchain and synthetic biology, which allows you to create life, and artificial intelligence, which allows you to create new forms of cognition, are starting to be commercialized. 
and expand dramatically, also changing everything that we are doing. So in the midst of all this change, there is some good news. And the good news is that for the first time in human history, I think, we have global consensus on a number of issues. I just list over here four major treaties that were signed in the last two years. The Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Climate Treaty in Paris, and uh, Habitat Three. And in these treaties is a reflection of the kind of consensus that we need to move forward as on a planetary scale as a unified force. We cannot continue to be fragmented, fighting our wars, because while we fight our little skirmishes and wars, we are also at war with nature. And that war is much bigger, and nobody can control it. So we need to find a way of unifying ourselves. And these treaties are one symbol of that unification. The knowledge challenge of the Anthropocene I'm going to depict it in the form of a few key elements. There is a paper that Future Earth produced in 2014 called Vision 2025 in which it articulated the challenges of sustainability. I'm not going to run through all of them, but just let me give you a flavor of how big the scope of these challenges is and what kind of knowledge is needed to address these challenges. Because this is a build up to my argument of why we need to unify knowledge. Food, water, and energy nexus. We have historically treated food, water, and energy as three different things, three different sectors, three different industries. It's only now that we are realizing that there is a deep interdependence between them. Food is water, water is energy. Energy is food. And we can't study one separately from the other. So understanding them in an interconnected way is absolutely paramount. Figuring out what are the trade-offs between making food and making energy, between conserving energy and conserving water. The second big challenge is around health. Environment and health are absolutely tightly bound. Last month, World Health Organization released a report in which said between four and seven million excess deaths are caused by environmental causes. There are also uh, forecasts that say that by 2050, the major cause of death of human beings is not going to be cancer or heart attacks or other things. It's going to be environmental pollution. So understanding health as a socio-ecological phenomenon, understanding planetary health, not just health of individuals as organisms, but as people who live with animals, with plants. They work in certain ways, they commute in certain ways, they play in certain ways. All of that constitutes health. This is a very different view of health than what the pharmaceutical companies want you to believe, that if you take a pill or get a surgery, you'll be cured. This view of health is deeply interconnected with the environment, both the natural and the social. Urbanization. This is going to be one of the biggest challenges. 2.5 billion new urban dwellers in the next 30 years. If you were to build a city of 1 million people each every week, it would take you almost 30 years with new cities going in to accommodate these people. 80% of this growth is going to be in Africa, and 70% uh, of the infrastructure that will be needed by the, end, by the middle of the century has not yet been put into place. So there's a huge challenge in terms of developing knowledge about urbanization. Natural assets, natural assets ocean acidification, uh, Sustainable economics, decarbonizing production and consumption, these are some of the other challenges. These are all planetary scale challenges. They're not challenges just for one country, for one region, for one uh, city. And in fact, we will not achieve sustainability if we try to solve this problem in its elemental parts. 
by trying to optimize the subcomponents and not worry about what the big system is doing. Now, the other thing I want to point out about knowledge in this period is not only that we need a lot of this knowledge in specific areas, but you are going to see a tremendous explosion of knowledge. And I just point out a few trends over here. Today, almost 50 million total papers are published. Uh, since 1665, total number of scientific papers published is about 50 million. And every year, we are now publishing 2.5 million new scientific papers in 28,000, over 28,000 peer-reviewed scientific journals. Think about this for a moment. What does this mean? How much knowledge is coming out? And who is keeping track of this? Whose purpose is it serving? 130 million books. US alone publishes up to a million books per year. And if you thought this was a big store of knowledge, wait till you see what is happening in the space arena. Just in June, the Chinese sent up a satellite that is going to, it's called the Hard X-ray Modulation Telescope. The purpose of this telescope is to create a map of every object in the Milky Way. We have this technology now that can really expand our universe, get, get us to know every dot, every movement that is taking place in the, in the galaxy, and make it available to people on Earth. For what? We'll come to in a second. Big data is emerging in life sciences, in genomics, in transportation, and mobility. Every time I click my button over here, somebody is recording it somewhere and selling it to someone. Every time you click something on your computer, you go to a website, somebody is keeping a record of all this. And all of this is being, becoming mountains and mountains of data. And while there is this explosion of data, there is also huge gaps in knowledge. And I want to point out a couple of them here. First is that the needs for knowledge in this period of the Anthropocene are to understand the world in a holistic way, in its historical and social cultural context. That is what is needed for sustainability. And we need knowledge not just for understanding, but for action. We need knowledge that actually solves problems. It is not sufficient to be sitting in your laboratory or in your uh, uh, offices in academia and writing papers anymore. You need knowledge that goes into policy making, that goes into action. The reality is that we have knowledge that is being produced in tremendous disciplinary fragmentation. There were five disciplines in 1260 when the University of Paris was founded. Five disciplines. Today, the National Science Register of Disciplines lists 8,430 disciplines. And this is just in one country. And it doesn't include a whole bunch of things that you and I would consider disciplines. So there are estimates from uh, people who do archaeology of knowledge that claim there are probably around the world more than 15,000 disciplines. And each discipline and, and all our reward systems and our universities are organized to work within those narrow confines. This is completely opposite of what is needed to understand the world in a holistic way. Besides the fragmentation of disciplines, the other big challenge or gap is in funding. As most world governments are running into financial challenges, they are cutting back on research funding. Funding is available, if it is available, mostly for local uses. There's very little funding available for planetary-wide science or planetary-wide or global activities. The mechanisms of funding, the rules about funding are all very narrow and parochial, looking at the problem in their own backyard when the problem is really at a global scale. Okay. Um, and then I want to say that 
for the first few hundred years of science, science was so productive that we kind of took it for granted that it was doing good. But now, there are some suspicions about science that are emerging. Important people, including Mr. Trump, are challenging scientific facts, creating alternative facts. In a, among, in, in, for example, in the climate area, we have both the president and uh, the head of the EPA who actually do not believe what 99% of the scientists believe. They have alternative narratives. If it was some crazy person on the street, we could have dismissed it. But if it is the president of the most large economy in the world, it tends to take root. It tends to get converted into policy. It tends to get converted into budgets, into actions. So science needs to find other forms of legitimizing itself and to maintaining its credibility. There are also suspicions about who is this science being serving. And there are all kinds of debate between people claiming that it is serving more private interests than public good, serving the interests of the 1% rather than the 99%, or the interests of the North rather than the global South. And then there are lots of suspicions about how we accumulate knowledge and who stores it, where it is stored, and how it is going to be shared. This is perhaps the biggest commercial question because much of this knowledge is convertible into products, into services, into money. And we don't have good data policies, we don't have good information policies that would ensure that the knowledge that is being produced, a lot of it from taxpayers' dollars, serves the interests of the taxpayers. So I think we need to integrate humanities and the arts and traditional ways of knowing with science for a variety of reasons. First, because science itself needs a continuous way of legitimation in the cultures that it is a part of, and that legitimation can come with a broader context of social and human sciences. Science also needs to expand its own domain from the narrow focus on technical knowledge, rational knowing, to more emotional and aesthetic knowing, because otherwise it is incomplete by choice. And I think there are scientists who are now coming to the realization that science is not the only form of knowledge, that it is not a complete form of knowing, and there are other modalities that need to be incorporated. And I believe that at least part of the reason for the environmental crisis today is a disconnection, an emotional disconnection between humans and nature. And to the extent that arts are a vehicle for human emotions, incorporating arts with science gives us a better opportunity to address the environmental crisis. Artists are already engaged in dealing with both environmental and social restorations across the world, almost as much as scientists, although they don't get half the attention. Humanities provides contextual knowledge to make sciences meaningful, and, and in the period that we are calling the Anthropocene, Humanities is the anthropo knowledge that becomes primary. So for these reasons, I believe there is an important function for scientists to be thinking of in terms of unifying art, science, and uh, traditional knowledge. Future Earth is a program that was created with the support of UNESCO uh, and with uh, other United Nations bodies such as UNU and uh, UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, along with a number of other stakeholders. And it was in 2012 at the Rio Plus 20 meeting that there was this realization that for 40 years we had been studying Earth systems. And we had understood a lot about these Earth systems. 
So we had studied population and ozone depletion and carbon, and we knew a lot about it, but virtually every, every variable that we were measuring, we had become worse on. So we were producing knowledge for understanding, but not knowledge for solutions. So what the, uh, this group of people who organized Future Earth did was they, they closed down some of the programs that were the precedents of Future Earth, the International uh, Biosphere, Geosphere Program, Diversitas, and the International Human Dimensions Program were brought to an end, and all their projects were handed over to this new group that was created called Future Earth. And there were two challenges posed to Future Earth. One was that they needed to make all this knowledge about humans and uh, Earth systems transdisciplinary. That means it was not okay to just do a study of the uh, physical carbon and its accumulation. You needed to connect it with uh, how to solve the problem of carbon in the atmosphere. So transdisciplinarity, meaning stakeholder engaged, co-creation of knowledge was one of the challenges. And the other challenge was to try to do this on a planetary scale so that we have solutions that will actually be effective in uh, dealing with the problems we face. So it's a platform that unites around common research agendas, and the research agendas are around the topics that I pointed out earlier. It engages science, policy, society in new ways. The research results of scientists are synthesized and fed to IPCC and IPBES and other policy-making or assessment bodies. And it attempts to do this on an international, regional, national, and subnational scales. I'll skip that one. This is just a, a quick slide on the governing council so that you get a sense of who are the people involved in Future Earth. I mentioned United Nations University, UNESCO, and UNEP. But we also have, from Japan, the Science and Technology in Society Forum. We have the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, the Belmont Forum is the G20 Nations NSFs, the National Science Foundation, which do all the funding. ISSC is the International Social Science Council. ICSU is the International Council for Science. And I'm hoping that next year when we present this, we will add CIP SH to this list. So these are the organizations that are uh, uh, involved in supporting Future Earth. What, does, what, does, what is the number on Future Earth? So there are about 50,000 scientists spread out across the globe in some just over 20 some research projects. I will show you a slide about what those projects are. There are five different locations from where it is managed in terms of a secretariat. And uh, there are seven regional centers two of them in Africa, one in China, one in India, for South Asia, and so on. So here is a list of some of the projects that Future Earth has, has been doing in the past, and it's just to give you a variety of, uh, give you a sense of the variety, but what I want to focus on is this new type of research entity that Future Earth is building. It's called a Knowledge Action Network. It's a group of scientists working with stakeholders, working with policymakers, working with funders, and users of science to create solutions, co-design and co-produce solutions with the users. And these are the nine areas in which these uh, Knowledge Action Networks have been established. Health, decarbonization, oceans, natural assets, water, energy, and food, transformation, which is uh, cultural and social transformations to sustainability, the SDGs, finance, economics, and cities. So this attempt has been going on for the last few years. One of the big challenges that Future Earth faces is 90% of its members, uh, the members that came to it from the various projects, are from the natural sciences. And it has been a real challenge trying to bring in social scientists and artists and other knowledge holders into the community 
to get to a common framework and a common language where they can talk to each other. But they're making progress. So I want to sort of come to the last part of my talk, which is about unifying, and some thoughts on how we might think about unifying and the processes for unifying knowledge across the different uh, knowledge domains. So sustainability as a holistic idea seeks the well-being not only of all people, but of all ecosystems and all species. So the knowledge that we develop need to be truly planetary in scope. Unification needs to be done with a planetary mindset, planetary understanding for planetary governance of resources to sustain life. Humanities and arts, as well as traditional knowledge, have a special role to play, because this is where a lot of human knowledge is embedded. They have been somewhat outside the scope of knowing about Earth systems and policy making about Earth systems, most importantly. And they need to be integrated centrally. And the, the unification needs to occur even within the sciences, as I pointed out. There are 8,000 some disciplines out there, and they don't talk to each other. So there's a kind of unification internal to science, and then between science, humanities, arts, and aesthetics. So unification to me doesn't mean that you need to know everything. It is not omniscience. It is the skill of finding the right pieces of knowledge to put together that can constitute a solution. So it's not that impossible a task. It is intensely local. It, is, it will have to be done around institutions in particular locales. There's probably no single global strategy of unification. Unification has to be happening everywhere. But it has to happen in a way that it drives solutions. So a few thoughts about unifying processes. I've already talked a little bit about transdisciplinarity and about the scope of science. So let me focus on the third idea over here on cultural dialogue of sciences. Over a 300-year tradition, science has kind of hermetically sealed itself in its own conversation. Even when there are opportunities for extending the dialogue to religion, to faith-based knowing, to traditional systems of knowledge, it has not been able to successfully create this dialogue. We desperately need for science to engage these other conversations that are going on. And in the, the Pope's encyclical was, I think, the first time where the religious, at least one piece of the religious discourse, was engaged with science to produce a document that both sides could agree on. And that gave me great hope that this kind of engagement of other ways of knowing can actually create some positive results. So how are we going to do the unifying at the institutional level? What are some of the barriers to unification? Uh, given that a lot of science, at least, and social sciences and arts are institutionally bound within universities, I will just make a few comments about the, the, the barriers within the university institutions. The first barrier, of course, is the reward system. As soon as you come into a university to start teaching, you are told that you're going to be evaluated on the papers you publish. Papers have become a measure of the output of science. And not only that you will have to publish papers, but that these papers have to be in certain particular journals. This kind of narrowly constraining people to do work that nobody else reads is tremendously wasteful, and it distorts the reward system. So people, even if they understand the problem, even if they want to do broader, synthetic, integrative, holistic work, are not able to do it because of the reward system within their universities. This is particularly true in North America, I think to a large extent also in Europe, 
And from my gleanings, India and China are also developing systems that are so narrowly tied to publications that it is not giving an opening for transdisciplinary work to emerge. Funding, there's never enough of it. And unfortunately, all the tracks of funding that are available for scientists today are tied to disciplines. So there is very little amount of money available for interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work. A second issue about unifying processes is at the cultural level. And here I just want to make one point, which is that we as advanced cultures have valorized a certain way of knowing, rational empirical knowledge. And we have demonized emotional and subjective knowing. And even the social sciences, which was hopefully, is hopefully more open to other ways of knowing, is trying to mimic methodologically the natural sciences to gain some level of credence and credibility and legitimacy in academic hierarchies. So we need to change this mechanism. We need to, as a culture, trying to under, uh, appreciate what emotional knowing does and why it is valuable for our long-term survival. We also need to encourage transdisciplinary research cultures within institutions, within organizations. And here I find that academia is again behind even corporations who are trying to move away from siloed sector or department-oriented structures to a little bit more open structures. And then finally, I think the, the biggest uh, unifying process has to happen at the individual level. You and me, we have to take personal responsibility for developing skills that we don't we are not born with these skills of transdisciplinarity. We are, we are all working within our own bubbles. And we are all comfortable within our own bubbles. But trying to stretch ourselves to break our bubbles and to peep into other people's bubbles, other organizational bubbles, other ideological bubbles, is a personal challenge that would need to be addressed to unify science. I think, and this is my last slide, we have in front of us a global consensus between political leaders, uh, between political leaders and business leaders that there are certain goals that we are going to collectively achieve, the sustainable development goals. And to me, this is the venue on which unification of science should be happening. We need to think about what it would take for each of those goals poverty, hunger, women's equality, education. How are we going to unify arts, aesthetics, traditional ways of knowing, scientific, both natural and social scientific ways of knowing to address each of those goals? Thank you very much.